Yes, hello everyone, welcome back to another interview here on On Clear Hill with me, Seamus Brady, your host, and for this one I am joined by Dara Maloney, in my opinion, the best commentator in the game. Dara, how's the form? Thanks a million for taking time it's, out of your day. It's good. How much do I owe you for that uh, introduction? Thank <laughs> you very much, Seamus. My words. A lot of people wouldn't agree with you, but that's okay. My, my personal favourite. You're allowed uh, to have an opinion. Well, thank there's you. One, that's, that yeah, there's, <laughs> there's, there's one game in particular that always stuck out in my head. It's the 2013 All-Ireland semi-final, Dublin mm. against Kerry. That game, yeah. Kevin mm. McMenamin's goal. Yeah. That your commentary for that is always like that's one of my favorite yeah. kind of 10 seconds Look, of work. Yeah, well, 10 seconds, 10 years ago. Um, that's crazy that it's it's gone so quickly. Yeah, look, I do. I, th I that was a really I think that that could be very close to my favorite game. Um, a GA match, uh, it was amazing. Now, look, you'd have other ones as well. Um, Limerick and Cork in the 2018 All Ireland hurling semi final, the Nicky Quaid yeah. save and stuff. So, look, I, I, it's funny, I don't, and I don't in any way take for granted what I do. I'm in a very privileged position and um, I'm really lucky to do what I do. Um, but yeah, like I suppose when you when you get a chance, you look back at say 2013 and like, you know, Magic Mulligan, I still get a bit from 05, which was against Dublin. Um, which uh, maybe helps me in the bias stakes. I don't know, but um, <laughs> you know. So yeah, the 2013 match that was that was one of the best matches I've ever seen. Never mind commentated on, you know, because yeah. just so much stuff happened in it. It was on a knife edge right until the end, and like, look, wasn't it seven points at the end that really kind of flattered Dublin and stuff? But um, yeah. you know, it was just the way it went. Like Kerry could have gone ahead before McManaman's goal. I yeah, think they had a chance. Wasn't that, shot, wasn't yeah. It? Yeah, he kicked a wide and um, like I thought again on the commentary, I remember thinking this was this is over and they're leading, you know, so it was just one of those great games. Um, and I was very, very fortunate to be there and be able to describe it. And you just look, these things just you, you, it's a roller coaster, you know. Um, yeah, so that you just kind of go with the flow and, and see where you end up, you know. That's it. And like in the moment, because like I've done it a tiny bit, like I've worked with, with Dublin GA commentating on some games for them. And you do kind of go with it. Like, do you have kind of constant things or, as you said, go with the flow? Is it more kind of see where the game takes you? Yeah, you have yeah. to. Like, look, do you know what? There's, I remember a, a very wise man. I used to work for a man called Niall Codley. When I started doing this, he was the head of sport in RTE and went on to work with Satanta and uh, did some stuff with, with TV3 and Virgin also. But he said to me when I started out doing this, he said, listen, there's only three things that can happen in a match. And he said, this is your framework. This is where you start. Somebody wins, somebody loses, or it's a draw. So, you know, you can kind of work around that that sort of framework, but they're, they're, that's the starting point. And then, you know, you get your information about the players. Uh, everybody has their own different different kind of likes with that. I, I kind of prefer, you know, maybe something that a, a guy or a girl is doing differently, maybe something that they've added to their game this year or they're working really hard on in training, whether it's, you know, kicking points off their left side or something like that. So... I'm not necessarily mad into he scored a million goals and a million points. Um, yeah. Maybe I maybe I like the, maybe something a bit different that he has 17 shredded weeds in the morning or whatever it is, you know. And like, look, you only get to use 10 percent of that stuff. So but when the game is on, you just follow the game and the, it, it ebbs and flows. And look, some of the matches aren't great. That's not your fault or, or anybody's fault. That's just what's there. And people can see it um, like on the television. A, a, a poor game is always a poor game. But on the radio, you can embellish it a bit and talk about yeah. other things. And, you know, it, it, you know, like a, people say if they were at that at a match or watching it on TV, God, I didn't like that at all because they could see it. But if you're listening to it on the radio, like it's a different experience. Like look at me, Hollow Mary Hertig or Martin's commentaries on the radio or me, Hollow Hair. Exactly. So, you know, all of those things, you can take it wherever you want to go. But I suppose what like. You know the the win lose or draw thing, but also like look the, the basic thing that you have to do as the commentator is you're meant to be an aid to the person who is watching the game, and it's just go with the flow. I would try like I see my job. So if you have a co-commentator with you, a guy who's got all Ireland medals or has you know managed a team to win an All Ireland, like I don't have any All Ireland medals now. Is probably not the time to talk about my Dublin minor hurling championship medal in 1989. I won't get into that with Vincent's, but, um, you know, so like they're the experts. So I would see my job, my job as a commentator is to tell you what the score is, what time it is, 
who's got the ball and do a bit of shouting and roaring if something exciting happens. The other stuff, the, the expert analysis comes from the experts, the person who will tell you how it happened, why it happened, will it happen again, how one crowd stop it from happening or, you know, keep, all those kind of the, the nuances, the tactical stuff. Um, like I'm fascinated by that stuff, but nobody wants to hear me talk about that because yeah. I haven't I haven't got a team to do it. I haven't done it in an all Ireland final. So, you know, I'd be quite clear on what I would what I'm required to do on the day of a match. Would well, like that that right there, I've noticed it in your work. I've noticed it in other kind of commentators or reporters that I'm really, really a fan of their work. Like John Anik is one, I don't know if you know him. He he works mm -hmm. at the UFC. Yeah. Whenever he interviews a fighter, you can tell he just has so much respect for them. He is very kind of, um, he's very much like, I remember there was one question where he asked this UFC fighter because he lost two title fights. And he said, if you were to go back and do them again, which one do you think you'd win? Or you'd be more likely to win? And he said, no comment is perfectly fine. Yeah. And I was like, I just like that because he was completely respectful of the fact that, listen, you know a hell of a lot more than I do. And like, oh yeah, like, that James, kind of dynamic the thing. I liked. And, and what's interesting about what you just said is, so, okay, there's several different sort of aspects of my role with RTE. The commentary is one, the presentation, you know, interviewing or the panel stuff or doing radio or whatever. One of the things, and I do it quite often, and I try and kind of check myself very quickly, um, is when you're, when you're, say, when you're, when you're interviewing somebody, ask them a question. How, why, where, what, when, who, you know, don't make a statement. And like there's certain people I listen to to kind of reset myself. Matt Cooper on Today FM is one of them who I love his interview style. And he might make a statement, but he'll follow that up with a question. Because if you go up to a player after an All-Ireland final and say, God, you played really well today. They're perfectly entitled to say, well, what do you know? Do you know what I mean? Like they're the players. So like, I, I think if you like, listen, all of this, particularly with the GA and then say in the League of Ireland and stuff, um, it's different in, say, with the Premier League or whatever, or Champions League, where, you know, the players are, are effectively paid to do interviews with the media afterwards. Our players are not paid yeah. for that. So it's about relationships. It's about goodwill. They're perfectly entitled to say no as well as yes. Um, you know, so there's no obligation for Desi Farrell or Kevin Max Day to talk to us. It's just the way you, you hope that they will because you have a relationship with them and you treat for, treat them in a respectful way. So, you know, I think if, if if there's somebody you don't know, if you treat them in a respectful way, the chances are they'll treat you that way back. So, you know, um, yeah, but I, I think, again, it's the old thing. Ask questions. Ask a question. Don't make a statement because, and I do it so often and I have to kind of re reset myself quite a lot. So, um, yeah, look, anyway, helpful hint, hint number five. <laughs> that's it um i was gonna ask you that next so i was mm. gonna say so i obviously have highlighted who some commentators are that i like i think marty for the hurling in particular i think he's yeah. fantastic like who growing up who would have been your kind of main people that you looked at and kind of were like oh god i'd love to be as good as them there, there are so many so look you know uh, o'hare jer canning marty like i did i get to work with these people now they're my friends um George Hamilton is, yeah. is still the best football commentator that there is anywhere. Um, you know, like, again, an icon for me. Like, I grew up, I, like, Euro 88, Italian 90, and the nation holds its breath. Like, I was sitting at home watching that. I was doing my leaving cert in 1990. Yeah. But um, it was in the middle of it. That's why I didn't do so well. Um, <laughs> I, I was too focused on the football. But, you know, so these are these are heroes of mine. Um you know, then, like, say, John Motts and Barry Davies was brilliant, the BBC football commentator. Martin Tyler from Sky, who I got to yeah. know, who's left Sky now, but the, the nicest man you can ever meet. And, um, I know there was a lot of debate about why he left and how he left and yeah, all that stuff that's been in the papers recently or in, in the media recently. Um, so, look, all, all of the above, you know, and, and I there's, there's not a day, I suppose, you, you have there's two things you can do. Like, I would have studied what they do quite a lot um in years gone by and still do and it's because i don't have the greatest vocabulary in the world so i i prefer to kind of keep it simple and straightforward um unlike somebody like george who's a real you know master of english and a real wordsmith and um uh, you know he always describes things in in a, the most appropriate and, and beautiful way which i just cannot i wouldn't be able to do in a fit so um yeah, I you know I suppose this, if you're watching a match just to watch it, that's fine. But if you're watching a match to analyze what the commentator is doing or the co-commentator is doing, like that's a different process. You'll have a pen and paper in your hand. So occasionally I would do that, and then I'd look back at my own stuff to try and 
make sure that it improves in some way. And um, if it's if, <laughs> if there's lots of you can always improve. Um, so yeah, I I, I would they're, they're two different experiences. But look, listen, I I I'm very lucky to work with people who I would describe as my heroes. You know. Yeah, no, definitely well put. There's one quote that I absolutely adore that um, Michal Omar Hertig said, the great Michal Omar Hertig. Oh, he yeah. said to Jeff and Cammy during their AIB series in 2017, Jeff uh-huh. Stelling was asking him at the start of the game for a bit of a last-minute advice. Michal literally just said, so I watched the video, I've transcripted out. He said, for those who are not here, paint as good a picture as you can, aided by the atmosphere and the history. Yeah. Like and Michal was the 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 master at that. I listen. Uh, I apologize. I should have mentioned Michal O'Hare Hertig as well as Michal O'Hare because like we have in our office and work, we've all these quotes. Um, uh, you know, from Bill O'Hare, from Michal O'Hare. You know, various great kind of iconic sporting moments that have been on RTE and they're kind of painted on the walls. And like, there's so many from Michal. You know, the 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 God and the referee and the ball and God and all those things and fox chasing the the, the rabbit chasing the fox and all that stuff. Um. He was just incredible. And again, I was really lucky for years to get to work with him and, you know, present programs that he was commentating on and, and stand behind him when he was doing a commentary. Um, you know, and, and there was one instant I remember in 1998, um, Claire and Offley had this kind of trilogy saga um, in the All-Ireland Hurling Championship. And it was it was controversial because the first game they met in the All-Ireland semi-final, Claire were massive favourites. And um, the referee blew the match up early with Claire leading. Uh, no, first day was a replay, excuse me. First day was a draw, second day was a replay. And in the replay, the referee, a man who's passed away recently, a man called Jimmy Cooney, blew the, the match up early. He thought it was an hour or whatever instead of the 70 minutes. Um, the Offaly fans got out on the pitch and had a sit-down protest. There was a refixture organised for Turles the following weekend, which Offaly subsequently won and went on to win the All-Ireland. But I stood behind Hall and Turles. I was presenting the programme. And I stood behind Michal and Thurlis that day and he had his son with him. He'd always bring his family members to help him with stats and various things. And they were brilliant. Um, and he had his son with him and awfully were kind of coming from behind. And as they got in front, he started to gently hit his his uh, son's arm. He was sitting beside him. Michal was standing up and he'd hit the son's arm. And then the match got more and more exciting and he'd hit him again. And like, you know, it was it, not hard. But at the end of the match, his son pulled up his top and his arm was all red, you know, from I think Mayhall had, had given him a few dunks, but he just used to get so immersed in the match. Yeah. Nothing around, nothing else around him mattered. And it was an amazing experience to watch. He didn't really hurt his son that badly, but it was just like yeah. he was doing it repeatedly. Um, it was funny to watch it. But yeah, he he was uh, on radio. Nobody ever better than him. Um, and Mayhall O'Hare, O'Hare, I grew up listening to him on the television. Um, and again, iconic moments with Offaly in 82, where my dad's from and all that stuff. So, you know, yeah, there you go. Oh, that's it. And like, just me, Hollow Hair, me, Hollow Hair, my favorite quote from me, Hollow Hair is the one about the 1947 All Ireland final. I'm sure that you have that one up somewhere in RT. Yeah. If anyone's along the way listening in, because yeah. of the context behind it. And I think when you're talking about with me, Holland, or Hertig, when you're talking about like the best commentators, what comes across is they really care. And you know mm. that if you were to talk to them outside of, you know, when the broadcast ends, you know that there's probably a good chance that they would talk to you for an hour about the game that they just saw. That mm. it's not just a it's not just a job, if you like. And no. that's what came across with me. How was trying, you know, five more minutes, five more minutes, <laughs> like everything like that. That and like the te- came across. like the technical stuff. Now it's just you press a button or a computer does it for you. And like even then it can go wrong. And maybe the old ways are better. But like you, you know that that time from from the Gaelic grounds in New York and kind of or the Polo grounds, wasn't it? Um, Polo grounds, yeah, uh, yeah. And and um, you know, to try and get that broadcast time extended, like that was a huge deal. You know, there was a, I'm sure there were there were countless people involved in making that happen and keeping it going. So um, it's much easier now, thankfully. Yeah, no, that's it. And to to talk about other sporting events that you've commentated on, I mean, the list here, the World Cup, <laughs> the Champions League, the Olympics. Mm. Like, what won? Surely the World Cup 2022 has to be up there in terms of, you know, yeah, watching look, it's Argentina, funny. The France. Yeah, I think so. And I think like that the final, the, the France Argentina final was the greatest football match I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, you know, but for 70 minutes, it was kind of crap. And it was just like they were 2 0 up, and you go, oh, this is like winning a World Cup shouldn't be this easy. France had, like, I think they had all that. There was the respiratory kind of COVID thing that had gone through 
because of the air conditioning in the stadiums and all of that stuff. Um, yeah, I haven't watched it again since. I watched it when I got home, but um, that was that's hard when you do other football or soccer matches and they're kind of like, Ugh. Um, but these are amazing. Like the two, listen, the two Champions League finals, because say the one last year in Paris, the one where all the trouble was um, with the, the French police and stuff, um, that was the first one I commentated on on TV. I'd never done it before. So that was mm -hmm. huge. But like the, the World Cup final, look, just to be at it, I, I'd been at one before in 2002 in Yokohama in Japan where um, Brazil beat Germany. And that was the only one I was at. And the reason I was at it was because I ended up, uh, there was a change with the flights or whatever to get home. We'd been out there for five weeks um, in 2002 and I was able to go, kind of arrived late at the match. And um, yeah, that was some experience. But look, last year was amazing and Mbappe and, and all that stuff and Messi. So yeah, it was, I mean, the, the it was the 18th of December was the, the one year anniversary. Yeah. So what are we now? 2023. 20, so yeah. That sounds amazing. crazy. Cause the whole country watched that game. So like in your head, did you like for all Ireland finals and stuff like that? Because I, I am interested in this when it comes to mindset. Yeah. Do you let yourself acknowledge that before no. or do you just like... No. keep it out of your head you're talking no, but, to your you know your friend in the commentary box that's it yeah no you can't like you can't because like it's funny actually like say myself and joanne Catwell did the rt sports awards last weekend and like that's more intimidating because you can see the people in the room and you're looking around yeah. and you're going there's all these sporting icons around us and they can actually see it and we had this thing at the start right at the start of the program the first link you know and you're kind of the adrenaline's flowing you're a bit edgy and you walk out and stuff and the auto cue failed just for like about the first it was the first two links that we had and it happened to joanne right in the middle of her first link and like normally listen we'd be well used to ad libbing and stuff but you need that that's a mindset where you think okay i need to learn off what i'm going to say here or have an idea in my head be, so i can do it properly but if you're in the other mindset where you know it's on a screen in front of you you know it's been beautifully crafted by somebody else again it wouldn't be me but you know and you're going to read it. But if it stops in the middle of it, it just froze. And Joanne was brilliant. She just skated over it. And then I had about five seconds to kind of gather myself and go, OK, I know my bit's not going to work now. So I'm trying to remember what it said. So we got away with it. But it's a real kind of nerve wracking start. But the, the, where you're doing the commentaries or where you're sitting in a studio or the panel, you can't see those people. So you've no idea, thankfully, because yeah. I think if you did, you, you wouldn't be able to open your mouth. So I, I would never think about that. And, and none of us really do because, like, as I say, you can't see those people. It's much more intimidating when you can see them, when you can, you know, go, in, go into the, the, look into the whites of their eyes kind of thing, you know? Now, they're not all looking at you, but, um, or you're not looking at them all at, at the same time. But, um, you know, it, it's, that's a different, it's just a mindset, but you don't think about it. Yeah, no, I get what you mean. It's, it seems to me anyway, from, doing a tiny bit of both of them the presenting is definitely more challenging to your nerves i think because when you when you actually meet someone face to face was like was there ever someone that you met especially early on you joined rt in 1995 mm. starting up like who was the first person that you had to interview or talk to where you felt like you just couldn't get the words out of your mouth oh god that's a good question um that is a very good question. Um, actually, one one that comes to mind um, is Paul McGrath. And like, again, Paul's Ooh. a hero of mine, right? Um, and I've got to know him a little bit and I've got to meet him quite a bit. But I remember like I was in I was in radio, Gabriel League, and we were doing an Ireland match in Lansdowne, the old Lansdowne Road. And um, I was the reporter. So I was out going down interviewing the manager or the players or wherever it was, Jack Charlton or something at the time. And um, Paul was doing the panel for us. He was like one of the experts in um, with, I think Con Murphy was presenting. And I was like, oh my God, Paul, I was only doing this maybe about a year and I was kind of proper terrified. Um, and uh, when the match finished, I came back up to the studio where we all were. And I think Paul was waiting for a taxi or something like that to get home. And he comes over to me and he goes, Daryl, was that okay? And I was like, uh, I was like, Paul McGrath, <laughs> A, talking to me and B, asking for my opinion. Like, this does, this should not happen. This doesn't happen. So I kind of completely got tongue-tied. But he was such a nice man uh, and is such a nice man. He's an absolute gentleman um, and a, a legendary figure in Irish sport. Everybody loves Paul McGrath. But, um, yeah, so I suppose maybe that, that kind of thing. Paul, Jose Mourinho kind of intimidated me, but that's what he does. And he apologized yeah. to me after it. 
um because he just kind of he did a kind of mic drop thing and walked off and like again if you look at the screen where we're talking what what Mourinho did I was interviewing him you didn't see me in shots but I put my hand out at the end to shake hands with him he was the Chelsea manager at the time and you just see him walking that way and kind of dropping the microphone and I was like you rude mm. whatever because it just made me look silly and uh he walked to the corner of the room and then came back and he said, I'm very sorry. That's just what I do. And he walked off again. So it was just part of the show <laughs> with Mourinho, you know. Um, but I and like, listen, I, Damien Duff, who I'd be pally with, Damien knows him and he kind of says, oh, yeah, that's him all day long. But he's he's kind of behind the scenes. He's not necessarily like that. But yeah, so Mourinho was kind of intimidating, but that's that's the way he wanted it, you know. Yeah, well, Mourinho is definitely a character. And like that's yeah. the other thing that Still I was going to say. He's still going, yeah. That's it, still going. And yeah. one of the things I was going to say was you've obviously then shared the studio with some characters. I mean, yeah. one of the favourite, one of my favourite debates that I've seen you host was when RT did that hashtag ask the panel, just 2014 World Cup. right? And Eamon Dunphy strongly believed that John Terry and Ashley Cole should have been called back into the England World Cup squad. And yeah. Kenny Cunningham was completely on the other side and said that they shouldn't have been called in. And just the two of them kind of like, yeah. in those situations they, where like, is it, is it kind of funny as the presenter, as the guy who's hosting it, when you know that they are about to completely disagree on something and you're just like, okay, here we go. Um, uh, well, I, I suppose, <laughs> look, you're meant to try and control it. And I probably didn't yeah. control it. Um, which is one of my faults with that. Like Bill was the master of Bill Hurley, the late great at, at doing that and being able to, to kind of pull things together. Um, like I knew there was a clash of personalities between the two of them always, um, you know, and that, that was never going to change no matter what I did. But I suppose, look, you've, you've, as long as things don't get too out of hand, you just, you're, you're, you know, you're, you're, and sometimes they do, but you, you try and as best you can control it. And look, I, I probably at times wasn't very good at that. Um, and I, I, I would have seen that as a kind of weakness with me. Um, but like, look, that's you, at, at the end of the day, you don't want the, the, the entire panel sitting there saying the same thing. That's kind yeah. of dull. So, you know, you want people with strong opinions who can back them up and who can articulate them properly. Um, but look, as, as long as it doesn't get out of hand, that's the main thing with it. But um, yeah, there was always it was always um, interesting with, with the two lads in studio. Well, that's it. And like for the viewer watching, we don't want to see people that all agree with each other because exactly. unless it's something that even one that was like my favorite one where someone had an opinion. This was 2019 All Ireland final, Dublin against Kerry. Johnny Cooper got sent off. And look, as a dub, that was a stonewall second yellow card. Just mm. stonewall. And then they went back into the studio and Pat Balan said, like, Cooper deserved to go or whatever. And Kieran Whelan and Joe Bully were saying it should have been a free out to Johnny Cooper. And I was number one watching it being like, how is Pat Spillane getting outvoted here? And then also, it is actually still entertaining because you're watching it. And now, because someone's gone, well, I don't agree with that. Now it's a hell of a lot more engaging because you're thinking to yourself, well, and in years to come, those are going to be the clips that everyone watches. People will still talk about she, you know, Sean Kavanagh versus Pat Spillane before the 2021 semi final. People still talk about Eamon Dunphy's famous rant in 2007, was it? It was about one of the. Oh, a journalist in England. One, yeah, the journalist, yeah. 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 That one. That, that yeah. one's insane. Like, look, these, are, I'm shameless, these are kind of iconic moments of TV. You know, when you're in the middle of them, and um, I'm sure like Michael Lester was hosting, and wasn't it Michael doing it in 19, was it? I can't remember. Mike, no, it was Joanne. Oh, was it Joanne in 19? Joanne. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, but like, you don't, you know, you're just trying to do your job. But like, at the end of the day, you want, like, RTE wants people with strong opinions and they're not afraid to disagree with each other at times. Um, mm -hmm. And as you say, that's as a, as a viewer. And at the end of the day, we're, we're not making these programs for us. We're making them for you. We're making them for the people watching at home. We're not making them for us. Um, so, you know, it's you, you want to make it as engaging as possible for the people watching. Um, and like it's changed so much over the years and God knows where it's going to go in the next five years. Like, you know, TV and media and broadcasting has just radically altered and shifted in the last five years. Like it's a totally different business. Like look at the newspaper industry and, and you know, what's happened with RTE over the past six months or whatever, you know, but mm -hmm. like 
it is just shifting so quickly um and like and the platform like you're on now um like you know if i'd said to you you'd be doing this five years ago you'd be going what or if you'd be watching yeah. an all-ireland final on your phone like come on you know so well, yeah part of the the core of it is it, like it, it's sport is all about opinions um mm -hmm. i'm sure it's about great players and it, but it's about our our opinion as a viewer or a spectator at the game what did you think um what do you think of that so you know you have it's nice to be able to try and reflect a bit of that and be able to engage people and and keep them watching you know and that's it and like one thing that i'd be interested to get your kind of thoughts on as well was particularly in gaa circles now the addition of the Tolton cup and then the promotion of the joe mcdonough has led to so many more games needing to be covered and when like GA goes come into the circle, then mm -hmm. there was the GA Go fixture release for 2024. And there was a lot of people who were saying, like, this is, you know, this isn't good enough, blah, blah, blah. And I was thinking, I was kind of on the other side where it was a bit like, these games wouldn't have been shown five years ago or six years ago. So we should be happy that they are being shown. That's a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I understand the argument about, oh, well, for old people, they wouldn't be able to work GEA go and everything like that and then I was thinking well a solution I would have is that it's sh it should be kind of on the GEA clubs then to be like okay we're gonna host a watching along we're gonna put it on our TV for all the old members in the club if they want to come down and watch it in the club we'll handle it and put it up on the telly for them things like that that my club personally Whitehall has done put it up on the TV and people yeah. come in and watch it like because there is so many games to cover. And one interview I really liked was Sean Kavanagh was speaking about doing the Sunday game. He was doing that on uh, Colin Parkinson's podcast, The Swan of Fish GA. He was doing it on yeah. that. And he Which was I talking love. about how many games are out to cover and how many points they have to make. And he said, sometimes there is just so many games. Yeah. Look, that's a problem. Um, and as you say, look, uh, I'm not going to sit here and, and defend RTE and GA Go because I would defend both of them, obviously, uh, because mm -hmm. of where I work, um, you know, but like there are so many games and like, how, how are you going to let people see these? I take the point as well. Um, I might pick you up on the old, uh, uh, the old viewers because I can be classed as old. So let's say we're elderly viewers, um, you know, but I, I, I take that point as well. And I know I have family down the country and I don't know what the broadband is like and stuff like that. They're, they're valid points. But um, and I think there is an arrangement for GA clubs that the subscription is cheaper. I, I'm not now. Listen, don't quote me on that. I don't know. Um, but I, mm. I, from memory, I think there is something there. But like, look, you know, the, the night. Let's let's talk about something I do know about, which is the nighttime Sunday game program, which Des used to present and Jackie does now. And that's just it's a minefield because there could be, you know, you could have thirty games to cover in ninety minutes of TV, um, or it's about a hundred with ad breaks and stuff. But like, I. I I don't know how they do it and you the because you're starting from a point where you're not going to be able to keep everybody happy and, yeah and you're you're kind of behind the eight ball because if you're from westmeath or longford or cavan or offaly and they've had a huge win their first win over whoever in so many years and you're only shown three minutes of it like of course you're going to get stick but like how do you do it um and you know look at, at this additional programs and stuff like that but um you know look Towson Cup, big fan of Joe McDonough, obviously huge, and Nicky Rackard, etc. But you know, like, the, it, it's there's like I think Orty are showing a hundred games this year, or did, um, yeah. with all the club matches, and and you're going, well, where where else are you going to put matches? And you know, I don't know. Look, it it is, um, it's it's a really difficult um, square to circle. Uh, it's a really difficult problem. Um, you know, and I, I don't envy like the editorial team on the Sunday night, the highlight show do a massive job in RTE, but it is very hard to fit everything in. And inevitably, there are going to be a fair chunk of counties around the country that are not happy with what they've seen on the TV because they, they feel there's a bias towards the, the so-called superpower counties and hurling football. Well, that's it as well, is that people do kind of need to understand that like, especially with the cameras as well situation a lot of people that kind of casually watch i feel like don't really get that the cameras have to be pre-booked to go there from a long time mm. back 
So and even yeah. if it's, you're right, even if it's just one camera and you see like streaming and COVID kind of lulled us all into a false sense of security that, you know, our oh, Jimmy's down filming the match on his iPhone, you know? And yeah. People were, but, uh, but, and, and at that time it was okay. You're going, all right, well, at least I can see it. I can't go outside the front door. And I did it myself. I subscribed to these things or, you know, and you, oh, I want to see this, but like we've all done it. Um, but like what happened in COVID times is not good enough now. If you're asking people to pay a five or a match or 750 a match or a tenner a game, like they want 16 cameras and, you know, 4K HD and all that stuff, you know. So um, everything is changing. COVID had so many uh, effects on, on so many parts of this country and people's lives and personalities. But, you know, that you could see that, you know, in COVID, we were happy enough for, for Jimmy to film it on his phone. Now we're not. Uh, and we're right to not be happy with that if we're gonna yeah. if we're gonna pay money for something, you know. No, no, well said. Look, there, I'm almost there. The last thing that I'm really, really interested yeah. in is you ran through a few names there that somehow it didn't click with me that of course you would have come into contact with them. Like you've obviously from covering Champions League and everything like that. Who's kind of <laughs> who's who's your Mount Rushmore? Kind of your four that you've met that you're like, how did I meet them? Because Martin, to rattle off Martin Tyler, Paul McGrath, Jack Charlton, like you just dropped in Jack Charlton. <laughs> he must have That's, been very intimidating as well. Oh, I was terrified of Jack. Yeah, uh, I remember actually being, uh, look, I didn't really know him, but I, I, because I worked in 104 in Dublin for a few years before that, and he was manager at the time, and I would have interviewed him quite regularly. And oh, he, like, because I'm not tall, he's like six foot three, a giant of a man. Kind of yeah. this huge figure and your your hands are shaking there's jack child again a hero of mine you know and you're going Gee. anyway um god who who would be i suppose i the 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 2006 world cup semi-final i'm going to name drop here but that's what you want me to do isn't it yeah so i remember i was there with trevor Stephen. we did it was italy and germany and um, italy won it was in dortmund and i remember looking behind me and behind me smoking the biggest cigar I'd ever seen because he'd just come back from uh, Cuba with his mate Fidel Castro was Diego Maradona. And he's behind me doing commentary for Argentinian TV. And of course, the stadiums were all non-smoking. This was the first time any of us had really seen this. And it was like, you know, the German security people were like, no, absolutely not. Um, and Maradona standing behind me smoking this huge cigar and not one of the security people went near him. So um, I think we just might leave it at Maradona, leave it there. The, the, you know, um, he was pretty like and we shook hands with him. I got a picture, but the picture was on some horrible little brick Nokia phone, which is long gone. Um, but uh, now he was he was cool. This entourage around him. And I remember mm -hmm. reading afterwards he had been sick and he had gone to Cuba to recuperate in their health system or whatever. And uh, yeah, he obviously was back to normal if he was smoking huge Cuban cigars that Castro had given him. But yeah, so I think I can't I can't beat Diego Maradona really. Um maybe I could throw Beckham in. I met him once. Um and people at home are more impressed with not with what he said, but what was he like and what was his hair like? And was yeah. his skin soft? And he got ah hair. Um I'm not getting into that. He was very charming though. Um so yeah, that'd be about it. Maradona and Beckham. Let's go with those two from the soccer world not bad at all anyway Dara it's been an absolute pleasure having you thanks, on thanks so much for taking time out of your day guys to anyone that watched the interview thanks very much for your time until the next one take care